In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. By the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and the Immaculate Heart of Mary, one with Louisa, the little daughter of the Divine Will, I enter into the Holy Divine Will. Come, Divine Will, come beat in my every heartbeat, come breathe in my every breath, come pray, adore, and reign in me. In the name of everyone and everything, past, present, and future, in, with, through, and for Jesus, Mary, and Louisa. In, with, and for all. That all may be for the glory of God and the good of all souls. Giving to God as if all lived in the most holy divine will. United with creation, redemption, and sanctification, praying as one in that one eternal act. For the kingdom to come, reign on earth. Fiat. Book of Heaven, Volume 17, Part 9 March 15, 1925 The Divine Will has the power to form the real life of Jesus in the creature. I was fusing all of myself in the holy divine volition, but while I was doing this, I felt all the bitterness of the privation of my sweet Jesus. And even though I am almost used to suffering the absence of him, yet every time I am without him, it is always a new pain. It seems to me that every time I remain without the life of my life, Jesus places a higher degree of pain, and I feel more vividly the pain of his distance. Oh, how true it is that in Jesus, both pains and joys are always new. Now, while I was abandoning myself in his will, my lovable Jesus put out a hand from within my interior, all filled with light. But in his hand, he also had mine but so identified with his that it could hardly be seen that, instead of one hand, there were two hands transformed together. And Jesus, compassionating my extreme bitterness, told me, My daughter, the light of my will transforms us together and forms one single life. The light makes its way and the heat that the light contains empties and consumes everything that may prevent the identification with my life, forming one single life. Why do you afflict yourself so much? Don't you feel this life of mine within you, and not fantastic, but real? How many times do you not feel within yourself my life operating? other times suffering, and other times I fill you so much with myself that you are forced to lose your motion, your breath, your mental faculties, and your very nature loses its life to give place to mine. And so that you may live again, I am forced to make myself smaller within you 
so as to let you acquire the natural motion and the use of your senses. But it is always within you that I remain. And don't you see that every time you see me, it is from within your interior that you see me come out? So why do you fear that I may leave you? if you do feel this life of mine within you. And I, how oh my Jesus, it is true that I feel another life within me that operates, suffers, moves, breathes, lays itself within me, but so much that I myself am unable to say what happens to me. Many times I believe I am about to die. But as soon as that life that I feel within me makes itself smaller, withdrawing from my arms, from my head, I begin to live again. But many times I do not see you. I feel you, but I do not see your lovable presence. And I fear. I am almost afraid of that life that I feel within me, thinking, who can be he who has so much dominion within me that I feel like a rag under his power? Could it not be also an enemy of mine? And if I want to oppose what he wants to do within me, he makes himself so strong and imposing as to leave me not one act of my will, and I immediately give him victory over me. And Jesus, my daughter, only my will has this power of forming its life in the creature. It is understood that the soul must have given me, who knows how many times, sure proofs that she wants to live of my will, not of her own, because each act of human will prevents the forming of my life. This is the greatest prodigy that my will can work, my life in the creature. Its light prepares the place for me. Its heat purifies and consumes everything that might be unseemly for my life and provides me with the necessary elements in order to develop my life. Therefore, let me do that I may accomplish everything that my will has established upon you. April 9th, 1925. Jesus binds the soul with the thread of his will. The beauty of the soul who lives in it the divine will operating in the creature and her acts done in it form a cloud of light that serves Jesus and the soul. After many days of bitterness and of privation, my sweet Jesus transported me outside of myself and taking me in his arms, he placed me on his knees. Oh, how happy I felt on the lap of Jesus after so many privations and bitternesses. However, I felt shy without the will to want anything or say anything and without my usual familiarity of the past that I would have with Jesus when he was with me. Jesus was doing so many things to me he clasped me tightly to himself, to the point of making me suffer. He placed his hand on my mouth, almost preventing me from breathing. He kissed me. And I? Nothing. I gave him nothing in return. I didn't feel like doing anything. His privation had paralyzed me and rendered me lifeless. Only I let him do. I was not opposed in anything. 
even if he had made me die, I would not have uttered a word. Then wanting me to say something, Jesus told me, My little daughter, tell me at least, do you want your Jesus to bind you all over completely? And I, do as you wish. And he, taking a thread in his hand, made that thread pass around my head, before my eyes, my ears, my mouth, my neck, in some, my whole person, down to my feet. Then looking at me with penetrating eyes, he added, How beautiful is my little daughter, all bound by me. Now, yes, I shall love you more, because the thread of my will has left you nothing that you might do without its constituting itself life of all of yourself. This has made you so gracious as to render you all striking and beautiful to my eyes. So my will has this virtue and power of rendering the soul of a beauty so rare, so striking, that no one else shall be able to equal her beauty. It is so great and so charming as to draw my eyes and the eyes of all to look at her and to love her. After he said this, I found myself inside myself comforted and strengthened, yes, but highly embittered, thinking of who knows when he would come back, and that I had told him not even a word about my hard state. So I began to fuse myself in his most holy will, and my lovable Jesus came out from within my interior, forming a cloud of light around me, Jesus leaned his arms on this cloud and looked at the whole world. All creatures became present before his most pure gaze. And oh, how many offenses from all classes of people wounded my sweet Jesus. How many plots, how many deceits and pretenses how many machinations of revolutions, as they were ready with unexpected incidents. And all this drew chastisements, such that entire cities were destroyed. My sweet Jesus, leaning on that cloud of light, was shaking his head and was embittered deep into his inmost heart. And turning to me, he told me, My daughter, look at the state of the world. It is so grave that only through this cloud can I look at it. If I wanted to look at it outside of this cloud, I would destroy a great part of it. But do you know what this cloud of light is? It is my will operating in you and your acts done in it. The more acts you do in it, the larger this cloud of light becomes, serving me as support, and to make me look at man with that love with which my will created him. It forms an enchantment to my loving pupils, and making present to me all that I did for love of him, it makes a compassionate will arise within my heart and causes me to end up compassionating the one whom I so much love. As for you, then, this cloud of light serves you in a marvelous way. It serves as light for your whole being. It places itself around you and renders the earth extraneous to you. It allows not one taste, even innocent, 
for people or for other things to enter into you and forming a sweet enchantment also to your pupils it allows you to look at things according to the truth and as your Jesus looks at them if it sees you weak this cloud closes around you and gives you its strength if it sees you inactive it enters into you and makes itself operative even more it is jealous to the highest degree with its light while acting as a sentry so that you may do nothing without it and it may do nothing without you therefore my daughter why do you afflict yourself so much allow my will to work in you and to concede not one act of life to your will if you want my great designs to be accomplished in you April 15 1925 the mission of the divine will is eternal and it is precisely the mission of our Celestial Father. I write only to obey, and to my great repugnance. After a holy priest had read my writings, he had let me know that in certain chapters, Blessed Jesus was exalting me too much to the point of telling me that he placed me near his Celestial Mama that she may be my model. On hearing this, I felt confounded and troubled. I remembered that I had written this only to obey and to my great repugnance, and that I was connected to the mission of making the divine will known. And I lamented to my Jesus for having told me this. Well, I am so bad and he alone knows all my miseries. This confounded me and humiliated me so much as to give me no peace. I felt such distance between me and the Celestial Mother, as if there was an abyss of distance between me and her. Then while I was so troubled, my lovable Jesus came out from within my interior and clasping me tightly in his arms to infuse peace in me, told me, My daughter, why do you trouble yourself so much? Don't you know that peace is the smile of the soul, is the azure and serene sky in which the divine sun makes its light blaze more vividly? in such a way as to let no cloud arise above the horizon that might occupy the light. Peace is the beneficial dew that vivifies everything and bejewels the soul with an enrapturing beauty and attracts the continuous kiss of my will upon her. And besides, what is it that opposes the truth? Where is this exalting you too much? Only because I told you that I placed you near my Divine Mother? Because she, having been the depository of all the goods of my redemption, as my Mother, as Virgin, as Queen, I placed her at the head of all the redeemed ones, giving her a distinct, unique, and special mission that no one else shall be given. The very apostles and the whole church depend upon her and receive from her. There is no good that she does not possess. All goods come from her. It was right that as my mother, I was to entrust everything and everyone to her maternal heart. Embracing everything and being able to give everything to everyone 
was only of my mother. Now, I repeat to you that just as I placed my mamma at the head of all, and I deposited in her all the goods of redemption, so I chose another virgin whom I placed near her, giving her the mission of making my divine will known. And if redemption is great, my will is even greater. And just as for redemption, there was a beginning in time, not in eternity, in the same way, for my divine will, though it is eternal, there was to be the beginning in time of its making itself known. Therefore, because my will exists in heaven and on earth, and is the sole and only one that possesses all goods, I was to choose a creature to whom I was to entrust the deposit of the knowledges about it, making known to her, as to a second mother, the qualities, the value, the prerogatives of it, that she might love it and jealously keep the deposit of it. And just as my celestial mother, true depository of the goods of redemption, is generous with whomever wants of them, so shall this second mother be generous in making known to all the deposit of my teachings, the sanctity of it, and the good that my divine will wants to give, how it lives unknown in the midst of creatures, and how, from the beginning of the creation of man, it yearns, it prays, it supplicates, that man return to his origin, that is, into my will, and that the rights of its sovereignty over creatures be given back to it. My redemption was one, and I made use of my dear mother in order to carry it out. My will also is one, and I was to make use of another creature, and placing her as though at the head, and forming the deposit in her, she was to serve me, to make my teachings known, and to fulfill the designs of my divine will. So where is this exalting you too much? Who can deny that the redemption and the fulfillment of my will are two unique and similar missions, such that, as they hold each other's hand, my will shall make the fruits of redemption be completed, and the rights of creation be given back to us, placing the seal on the purpose for which all things were created. This is why this knowledge of the mission of our will interests us so much, because nothing else shall do so much good to creatures as it shall. It shall be the fulfillment and the crowning of all our works. Furthermore, of David it was said that he was an image of me, so much so that all of his psalms reveal my person. Of St. Francis of Assisi, that he was a faithful copy of me. It is said in the Holy Gospel, Be perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect, no less. It is also added that no one shall enter the kingdom of heaven if he is not similar to the image of the Son of God, and many other things. About all these, no one says that they have been exalted too much, and that these are things not conforming to truths spoken by my very mouth. 
only because to you I said that I wanted to compare you to the Virgin, to make you her faithful copy, I have exalted you too much. So comparing those to me was not exalting them, nor did anyone raise any doubt or difficulty. But then comparing to the Virgin, that's too much exaltation. This means that they have not understood well the mission of the knowledge of my will. Indeed, I repeat to you that I not only place you near her as her little daughter on her maternal lap, that she may guide you, instruct you on how you must imitate her to become her faithful copy by always doing the divine will so that from her lap you may pass on to the lap of the divinity. In fact, the mission of my will is eternal, and it is precisely the mission of our celestial Father, who wants, commands, expects nothing else but that his will be known and loved, that it be done on earth as it is in heaven. So you, making this eternal mission your own and imitating the Celestial Father, must want nothing else for yourself and for all, but that my will be known, loved, and fulfilled. And besides, when it is the creature who exalts herself, one should think about it. But when she remains at her place, and I exalt her, all is permissible to me, making one reach wherever I want, and the way I want. Therefore trust me, and do not be concerned. April 23rd, 1925. Each act which the creature does in the divine will is a kiss that she exchanges with God and with all the blessed. Once the divine will is established in the will of the creature, she has the eye, the hearing, the mouth, the hands, the feet of the divine will. I was fusing myself in the holy divine volition according to my usual way, and my sweet Jesus, making himself felt in my interior, told me, My daughter, come into the immensity of my will. All of heaven and all things created by me live and receive continuous life from my will, in which they find their complete glory, their full happiness, and their perfect beauty. And they anxiously await the kiss of the pilgrim soul who lives in the same will in which they live to requite her with their kiss and to place in common with her the glory, the happiness, the beauty that they possess so that their number may be increased by another creature who would render me complete glory for as much as is possible to a creature and would make me look at the earth with the love with which I created it. Because on earth there is a creature who operates and lives in my will. Since heaven knows that nothing glorifies me as much as a soul who lives in my will, they too long for my will to live within soul's honor. So, each act which the creature does in my will is a kiss that she gives to and receives from he who created her and from all the blessed. But do you know what this kiss is? It is the transformation of the soul with her creator. It is the possession of God in the soul 
and of the soul in God. It is the growth of the divine life in the soul. It is the accord of the whole of heaven, and it is the right of supremacy over all created things. The soul, purged by my will, through that omnipotent breath that was infused in her by God, no longer produces the nausea of the human will. And therefore, God continues to breathe upon her with his omnipotent breath, that she may grow with that will with which he created her. On the other hand, the soul who has not yet been purged feels the attraction of her own will, and so she acts against the will of God, doing her own. God cannot approach her to breathe upon her again until the soul gives all of herself to the exercise and the fulfillment of the divine will. You must know that in creating man, God infused life in him with his breath, and in this life, he infused in him an intelligence, a memory, and a will to place them in relationship with his divine will. And this divine will was to be like a king who was to dominate the whole interior of the creature and give life to everything in such a way as to form the intelligence and the memory wanted by the supreme will in her. Once this was formed, it would be as though natural for the eye of the creature to look at created things and to know their order and the will of God over the whole universe. Her hearing was to hear the prodigies of this eternal will. Her mouth, that was to feel itself breathed upon continuously by its creator, to communicate to it the life and the goods that his will contains, was to echo that eternal fiat with its word, to narrate what will of God means. Her hands were to be the outpouring of the works of this supreme will. Her feet were to do nothing but follow, step by step, the steps of her Creator. So, once the divine will is established in the will of the creature, she has the eye, the hearing, the mouth, the hands, the feet of my will. She never departs from the origin from which she came. Therefore, she remains always in my arms. And it is easy for her to feel my breath and for me to breathe upon her. Now, this is precisely what I want from the creature, that she let my will reign in her, and that her will may serve as the dwelling of mine, to let it deposit the celestial goods it contains. And this is what I want from you, so that all your acts marked by my will, may form one single act. And uniting to the single act of my will that has no multiplicity of acts has in man, they may remain in that eternal beginning in order to copy your creator and to give him the glory and the contentment that his will be done in you as it is in heaven. You have reached the end of the Book of Heaven, Volume 17, Part 9. Fiat Dearest Lord Jesus, 
I thank you for your lessons of today. Free me from living one single instant outside of your will. Have pity on me and do not permit that I either know or acquire any other life except that of your divine will. Fiat et amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.